good, good evening. Welcome to the Gloucester and Cheltenham branch lecture. I'm really looking forward to this lecture on the history of the Doughty Group. I first heard Ali McConnell speak on this subject at a lecture to the Cheltenham Local History Society, and I know you will find it fascinating. So let me first of all briefly introduce Ali. Uh, she first decided she wanted to be an archive, uh, archivist when she was doing her first degree in English. After finishing that degree and a subsequent uh, English master's degree, uh, she then went, up to, went on to build a suitable experience volunteering at heritage organisations uh, and then did a master's degree in archives and records management. On the back of this, she got a job as an archivist at the Wiltshire Council, but Ali was keen to get back to Gloucestershire. And after four years at Wiltshire Council, the opportunity came up for a two year cataloguing project to sort through the extensive Doughty archive, which had been sitting unlisted in the Gloucestershire archives since 1997. For the next two years and beyond, Ali worked with volunteers on making the Doughty archive as catalogued and accessible as possible. This included working on a community archive website and Facebook group. It was through the website, incidentally, that Sir George Doughty's son, also George Doughty, contacted Ali about Sir George's autobiography, but I'll leave Ali to tell you more about that. Ali is now a senior archivist at the Gloucestershire Archives. Ali, over to you. Thank you very much, Oliver, and thank you very much um, for inviting me along this evening. Um, it's it's really great to be able to talk to you about um, the history of the Doughty Group um, towards the end of this very long project to catalogue the extensive Doughty archive. Um, I'm also very pleased to be sharing quite a lot of the history of the Doughty Group this evening using excerpts from Sir George Doughty's autobiography, which he dictated shortly before he died in 1975 and which has been previously unpublished. Um, as Oliver said, I was approached by Sir George Doughty's son, also George Doughty, through the Community Heritage website and he had this autobiography which hadn't been published and wanted to be able to publish it somehow and one thing led to another and it was published at the end of 2020 edited by myself um, and uh, with a lot of input as well from George Doughty and, and the family. So um, this evening I'll be talking to you about the history of the Doughty Group, um, which was one of the most prominent employers in the Gloucestershire area for much of the second two thirds of the 20th century. I'm speaking to you really in two capacities. I am the archivist cataloguing the Doughty archive, which as I said is about to finish, but I also had the privilege of recently editing the autobiography and so I'm going to complement the, um, the history of the Doughty group using Sir George Doughty's own words. Um, because I will be using Sir George's autobiography, the history will be largely focused on the earlier Doughty years between 1930 and 1975 when he sadly died. So this is the, the book um, which I'm also promoting. Um, it was published, as I said, at the end of 2020 um, and uh, is, is entirely his own words with his own foreword as well um, and a little introduction by his son. Um, and I'm really pleased with it. It looks amazing and I've heard a lot of good things about it from other people as well. So this is the Doughty archive. Um, on the left is me um, towards the end of the reboxing. As you can see, it's very um, it made my office very small. Um, there were 1500 of the boxes on your right as part of the Doughty archive and so it was a big task to sort through them all um, and uh, I was listing and renumbering and relabeling and repackaging um, and also doing a bit of appraising as well so it was a, a bit of a mammoth task and then making everything look really like the picture on the right, um, making it all accessible, packaged nicely and um, hopefully uh, very interesting to people for generations to come. Um, so I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about how the Doughty Archive ended up at Gloucestershire Archives and then I'll move on to the history of the Doughty Group. The Doughty Archive 
was until recently the largest single uncatalogued collection held at Gloucestershire Archives. Gloucestershire Archives has been based at the same site since the 1970s, which is an old school site in the centre of Gloucester, and it was recently transformed into the Gloucestershire Heritage Hub as part of a project called For the Record. The Gloucestershire Heritage Hub has many partners from across the counties of Gloucestershire and South Gloucestershire, including Saffron Landing Systems, and one of the projects that the transformation hoped to achieve was the cataloguing of the business archive of the Doughty Group. And this had been stored in the archives since 1997, and it was so large that very little could be done to make sense of it without external funding. But this funding came in the form of the funding for the Gloucestershire Heritage Hub, and it enabled the employment of a project archivist, um, who was myself, to work for two years full time on cataloguing the archive and also reaching out to the local and wider Doughty community. And this part of it involved setting up the Community Heritage website using volunteers from within the Doughty community and people who just wanted um, experience volunteering for archives to enhance and make more sense of the archive and also carrying out oral history interviews with people who used to work for the Doughty group. The project, the cataloguing project, is about to finish, but the website and the oral history interviews will continue, as I hope will the many conversations that have been started by the project. So as I said, the Doughty Archive is a huge collection and it's taken a great deal of time to make sense of it. It's entirely a business archive, there's very little on the Doughty family, so it's been really nice to work more recently on Sir George Doughty's autobiography and find out a bit more about him as a person. This is easy to do because he wrote it himself, not long before he died, and I feel like I really understand him and his company much more as a result of reading his book. The archive contains a lot of information that can um, complement the book and vice versa. As business archives go, it's quite standard, but on a huge scale, in that it contains most of the basic administrative records of the business, such as legal documents, minutes, accounts and correspondence. However, we also find boxes and boxes of files from the patents department, the legal department, the publicity department and HR personnel. We hold apprentice records, thousands and thousands of negatives of Doughty products, photograph albums showing the large number of sites owned or leased by the group across the whole world, and also lots of records of other companies that were owned or merged with the Doughty group across the decades. Um, two important ones are Bolton Paul Aircraft of Wolverhampton and Rotel Airscrews of Staverton. These records all help us to understand the group's history from a small muse loft in the middle of Cheltenham in the 1930s, employing just two people, to a multinational company employing thousands of people in the aviation industry and also various other industries that they diversified into. So the picture in this slide shows 10 Lansdowne Terrace in Cheltenham, which was the first Doughty factory such as it was. George Doughty rented it when he handed in his notice at the Gloucester Aircraft Company to manufacture internally sprung wheels for the Kawasaki company who had responded to an advert he put in aircraft engineering in May 1931. Doughty himself had been working on various inventions since he started working in the engineering industry in the 1920s. Due to financial issues, he had to manufacture the wheels for the Kawasaki company himself and he rented this property to do so. He wrote in his memoir, the only equipment I had was a workbench with a hand operated pillar purchased for £3.15 shillings and a piece of plate glass to serve as a surface table. I worked night and day making production drawings, ordering materials and placing orders for the machine fittings. I employed two men who worked in the evenings assembling the wheels and they agreed to be paid when I was paid. He somehow completed the order on time and on budget and this was the start of an impressive career in the aviation industry and beyond. struts and describes their manufacturer by one of his first employees who was called Joe Balstead. He writes, the parts of these struts were machined on a foot operated lathe by a Mr Balstead who was to be one of my first employees in the cellar of his house. It is difficult to understand how these units ever came to be flown in for they were not covered by aeronautical inspection department release notes. In fact I probably did not know such notes existed and apparently nobody cared. Those were happy days. 
So George Doughty was born in Pershaw and moved around several times before coming to Cheltenham and working at Sunning End Works, now the Lansdowne Industrial Estate near the station. And it was during this time that he began reading and writing papers for the Institute of Aeronautical Engineers and attempting to get his name recognised. In the Doughty archive, we have some copies of letters between Doughty himself and various companies that show his intent to get his early patents registered and protected and, if possible, get products made. He had to work very hard to get this achieved and it would take several years before the first order I have described. He set up a company called the Aircraft Components Company while still working at the Gloucestershire Aircraft Company to try and get some business and he also produced an illustrated brochure for his products along with his twin brother Edward. The letters that we hold here are the earliest documents held in the Doughty archive apart from some 18th century deeds of land in Shutesbury which was later to become the site of a Doughty factory. George Doughty was born on the 27th of April 1901 to William and Laura Doughty. He had a twin, Edward, who helped him a lot with developing his company in the early days. He writes, Edward Flexton, my twin, and I were so alike in every particular that on our right feet we both had a hammer toe. Doughty writes with clear affection for his twin in his autobiography and recalls Edward's premature death with great sadness. Edward was to die in a motor accident. And he writes, on January the 22nd, 1945, a great tragedy occurred. We were both travelling to London by car with Sir Roy Fedden, Dick Spires, our, our chief service engineer, and my chauffeur Oliver, when some miles before Oxford we were struck sideways by a heavy army lorry out of control. It hit our car sideways, pushing it off the road and down an embankment. My twin brother, sitting on the outside, took the full force of the impact. Edward was taken to the Oxford Infirmary and George was able to go home but sadly he did not return in time later that day to see his brother still alive. And he writes later, the loss of my identical twin was a most terrible shock. We had grown up together, we thought alike, we spoke alike and had the same characteristics and mannerisms. Our lives were uncannily similar. His loss affected me greatly and after 30 years his memory is still as strong as though he was still alive. Although they were alike in many ways, George and Edward, Edward differed in their career pursuits. Edward was a pianist and organist and George obviously went into engineering and he was the only member of his family with an interest enough to pursue a career from it. His early years were not without incident. At the age of 11, he started experimenting with magnesium powder used by his father for his developments in photography. He set light to a bottle of powder and it exploded in his face, causing him to lose his right eye. Despite this setback, he continued to be very good at sports and of course, extremely detailed engineering drawings. But it's amazing to think that he was able to achieve so much, so much precision with only one eye. A year later, his father died of a stroke, leaving his mother with eight children and not much capital. Some of George's siblings had already left home, but his older brother returned home to look after the family business. And George found a new father figure in his brother-in-law who was sadly killed during the First World War. In the few years of this friendship, his brother-in-law Sidney got him interested in engineering, giving him a model steam engine and a book called The Wonders of the Engineer. George writes, Nowadays a child's creative talents can be inhibited by the wealth of ready-made toys, but in my case necessity was the mother of invention. I can remember how I contrived a miniature set of fairground gallopers operated by the steam engine, making use of an old umbrella, an old umbrella frame. Making toys stimulated imagination and initiative and no doubt helped me in my inventiveness. Sydney was later to give George a model aeroplane around the same time he saw his first real life plane and the lifelong love of aircraft was born. During George's teenage years, he worked at a factory in Worcester but attended evening classes in mechanical engineering. Between 1918 and 1919, he developed his first proper interest in aircraft engineering. He'd already had varied experience in the aviation industry accumulated by that time, and it had made him critical of the way things were being done. He always wanted to improve. His knowledge and learning meant that by the time he got a job at AV Row in 1920, he was regarded as the undercarriage expert there, and he designed the undercarriage for the Avro Aldershot at the age of just 19. In the next few years, he was to make a name for himself throughout many companies as an undercarriage expert. 
and when he got his job at the Gloucester Aircraft Company at the age of 23, he'd already written several papers for publications on how to improve various designs. The chairman of the Gloucester Aircraft Company was called Alfred Martin, and he would become instrumental in George's success just a few years later. In the years after George's first proper order from the Kawasaki Company, orders began to arrive for parts slowly but surely. His name became known more widely and he started employing more staff. He left Lansdowne Terrace and rented a place in Grosvenor Place South in Cheltenham. And in 1932, he changed his company name to Aircraft Components Limited. The annual turnover then was £2,800 and there were five employees. A year later, the turnover had increased to £5,000 and there were 11 employees. Within two years, the company would expand into one of its most prolific premises, Arl Court in Cheltenham, and in 1940, the company was renamed Doughty Equipment. By the time Doughty Group Limited was formed in 1954, the company employed over 13,000 people worldwide. Early records of the Aircraft Components Company and Doughty Equipment show the development of the company as well as employment of its staff. The archive holds engagement forms and salary books for personnel, legal documents relating to the formation of the company, business registration forms, sales ledgers and order books. This was all happening in Cheltenham, from the first premises in Lansdowne Terrace in 1931, to premises in Grosvenor Place South, then to Bath Street and finally to Arl Court which remained the company's headquarters for nearly 60 years. Alcourt was purchased in 1935 by George Doughty with the help of Alfred Martin, who I've already mentioned. Martin financed the company and enabled it to expand and move to large premises. Initially, Doughty wanted to build a new factory on the outskirts of Cheltenham, but he was told he couldn't by the council. But luckily, he found Alcourt, which was a mansion with 80 acres of ground and eight cottages and the present Arlcourt building was constructed in 1834. It had been deemed too large for a private residence, so it was being sold cheaply, and the council agreed to Doughty's pursuit of it for a factory. He bought it in 1935 for £6,500. He turned the mansion house into offices, and the outbuildings, stables, coach houses and garage became homes for workers. Alfred Martin, who had put so much money into it, joined the board as chairman, and George was able to get much needed loans then from banks, which enabled him to purchase the equipment he needed to make his products on a much larger scale. And you can see from this slide, um, this is the Doughty Board of Directors in 1942, and A.W. Martin is the first one, and George Doughty is the second. Just two years later, another company was to arrive in the Cheltenham area. In 1937, Rolls-Royce and the Bristol Aeroplane Company formed a joint company called Rotol Airscrews and they manufactured propellers and landing gear for aircraft. 20 years later, this company was sold to the Doughty Group in what is arguably one of George Doughty's most important purchases. George Doughty started his company just eight years before the start of World War II. By the time the war came, the company had become well established and contracts were, had been awarded for lots of different aircraft. However, when the war started, the requirements from Doughty's companies grew. Aircraft components began subcontracting and took on huge numbers of orders. Doughty wrote in his book, the placing of contracts, the allocation of materials, the day-to-day -day liaison, the settling of innumerable queries, all these were controlled effectively from all court, such that at the end of hostilities, we could claim the unique record that not a single aeroplane throughout the war years had ever been grounded for lack of a Doughty spare. From the archive, we find a few documents relating to the war. The most interesting of these, in my opinion, is a very small notebook, presumed to have been written by George Doughty himself, showing the growing numbers of orders, sales and overheads from 1938 to about 1946. After the war, the orders and sales naturally lessened, as you can see, but the notebook shows that the company was still making money, and you can see a gradual increase um, after the end of the war, um, in, in the orders that were coming back in the 1940s. Doughty grew his companies both in industry and geographically during the war. He continued to invent improvements to aircraft, but also started repair work, taking on a new factory in Ashchurch for the purpose of taking crashed aeroplanes and reconditioning them and putting parts back into the production line. The factory in Ashchurch was the first of many in the Ashchurch and Dukesbury areas. 
Soon, many others would be built and many thousands of people would be employed in the area for companies such as Doughty Mining Equipment, Doughty Seals and Doughty Electrics, diversifying industries for George Doughty. The Ashchurch factory had previously been a Bird's Custard Powder factory, and you can see it in the top picture, and Doughty employed many of the former employees, about 40 girls who had previously been making custard powder. He writes in his book, in order to give them some preliminary training, we persuaded the engineering department of Cheltenham Technical College to take them for a two weeks course. But no sooner had they arrived than we had a call from the head of department saying these girls were wrecking the place and quite out of control and we must take them away. We only had two educational films to show them. And at the end of the fortnight, we could say that we had the only 40 girls in the world who could pack custard powder and read a micrometer. In 1944, Doughty took out a patent for the bonded seal, which was to become one of his most successful products. Doughty Seals started life in Cheltenham, but quickly moved to Ashchurch, where it stayed for many decades. In fact, the company Trelleborg is still in the area, making Doughty Seals today. After the war, Doughty also grew his seals business to Malta, creating the company Malta Rubber, which was at one point the largest individual employer in Malta. During the war, Doughty's business and other businesses providing industrial help with the war effort were not allowed to make profits. Therefore, the company came out of the end of the war with no more capital than it had before the war started. However, the shrewd businessman Doughty was made sure that his company utilised the techniques and knowledge it had developed in the years before. He writes, I well remember that then the many aircraft companies went into abortive schemes on which they lost heavily. But surely I thought, we had accumulated under the stress of war a kind of wealth which could not be taken away, a wealth of knowledge. It was then that we looked to see how we could profit from the techniques we had developed. We thought of ways in which this knowledge could be applied to other industries. And because of this thought, Doughty was able to retain his workforce and start to profit from the huge amount of knowledge that he and his companies gained through the war years. And from this, the seals business grew rapidly, as did developments in the mining and hydraulics industries. Doughty mining equipment and Doughty auto units, later Doughty hydraulic units, were set up in 1948. And during this time, Doughty's Canadian company, which had been based in Montreal since 1939, moved to Ajax, Ontario. And the future chairman of the Doughty Group, who was called Robert Hunt, was sent to Canada to take charge of the company there. I've already mentioned the Staverton company, Rotol Air Screws, which was established in 1937. You can see on the second, uh, the right hand picture on this slide, the, um, the factory in Staverton in camouflage during the war years. Doughty was approached in 1958 by Lord Hives, who was the chairman of Rolls Royce, to see if he would take over the company. This happened in 1959 and it increased Doughty's personnel by 4,000. The company was renamed Doughty Rotol and the acquisition allowed the Doughty Group to become Europe's largest manufacturers of aircraft equipment at the time. Another important acquisition for George Doughty was in 1951 when he purchased the new Mendip Engineering Company of Atworth in Wiltshire. The company joined the already established company Doughty Fuel Systems and by 1969 Doughty Fuel Systems had over 1000 employees. It is the company which is probably best represented in the Doughty archive. Thanks to donations from former Doughty Fuel Systems employees, as well as a bit from the main archive of the Doughty Group, we hold many technical and instruction manuals, Ministry of Defence contracts, brochures and drawings from the company, which did work for the British and American Armed Forces, the British government and high profile aircraft manufacturers such as Rolls Royce. Doughty Fuel Systems had a site at Isle Court, as well as a test site at Staverton Airport and the original site at Atworth, among other sites across the country. It is one of the Doughty companies remembered most fondly by people I speak to about Doughty Group. A really interesting series of records that Gloucestershire Archives holds is a series of site plans and valuations which belong to the property department of Doughty Group Services. 
The group owned or rented a significant number of sites, which they helpfully numbered in order of when they purchased, of when they were purchased or leased by the company. The first site, number one unit, was Isle Court in Cheltenham, forming the first proper headquarters. The sites then grew and grew. Um, numbers 26 and 27 are in Staverton. And the largest number I've currently found is number 303 unit in Quebec, which is occupied by or was occupied by Doughty Aerospace Montreal. The Doughty archive includes correspondence about the maintenance of various units and sometimes legal documents relating to them. But I find the site plans really interesting, especially if you're interested in the history of a building or a place. The site plans only tend to continue until the 1980s and very few of them are for international sites but they have allowed us to work out exactly where some of the sites were in Cheltenham and Shepesbury and others. Some, sometimes the sites have gone or they've been developed. One of the things that the Doughty Group did with great success was create an excellent apprentice scheme. Many of Doughty's apprentices came to the group at the age of 16 or even younger and stayed for decades. An apprentice from 1935, Robert Hunt, became Doughty's deputy chairman and then chairman after Doughty's death in 1975. Doughty was a great supporter of the apprentice schemes and also the pension scheme, and those who remember him always say he treated his workers very well. He writes, From those early days, I have taken the keenest interest in the education of young men. The apprentice system, now almost unknown in other countries, has served my companies well. And I am proud of those men who, coming to us in their early days, have made good and reached top positions in industry. He was often disapproving of people coming into the business after receiving a degree. He writes of a time when he visited Cambridge University to see their engineering department when he was being encouraged to take in young graduates. He was shocked by the standards that were being taught. And he writes, on entering the engineering shops, I was shocked to see such, such great untidiness. Had they been my shops, the manager would have been promptly sacked. Certainly the workshops of the North Gloucestershire Technical College was a model compared to the machine shops at Cambridge. Men of 20 years of age were engaged in making bench vices, work done in modern secondary schools by boys of 14 or 15. Others were working in the carpentry shop. Even our apprentices do not go into the carpentry shop unless they are trade apprentices. I did not know that men spent their time at university doing these things. Passing into the laboratories, I was surprised at the elementary equipment. In one section, there were six sets of equipment for doing simple, simple crippling of flat, of flat plates. Sorry, Work I did at night school by the age of 16. The drawing work being undertaken was similar to that in a secondary technical school by boys of 14. The work I saw at a Cinderford school some months before was every way as good as the drawings being done at Cambridge. In one of the laboratories, I met a Canadian aged 22, determining the out of roundness of a ball bearing using what looked like an inverted egg cup with a compress air jet. He had spent one year on this work, but found it so absorbing he was to spend a further year on this investigation. Another student had spent two years on the flow of liquid in pipes and had an amazing array of equipment for making all sorts of wave patterns, which seemed an amusing pastime. When I asked where it was leading, I got no constructive answer. Another graduate had spent two years investigating oil leakage past piston rings. When I asked him what, had, what he had discovered, he made the somewhat astonishing reply that it depended on the accuracy and finish of the rings. When I asked Wellborn, who was in charge, why these men spent so long on these particular problems, he confided in me that they were not interested in training engineers. Their job was to get men to think mathematically. He told me that he doubted if half the men there knew how an internal combustion engine worked. I was horrified. Even the head of the engineering department seemed to have a bee in his bonnet by designing structures on a basis which he described as the theory of rusty hinges. I thought I might have seen some advanced training on subjects to make for the balanced engineer. However, it seemed that the products of this university would probably end up goggle-eyed mathematicians with a job in the corner of some stress office. Having spent only a day in the engineering department, it may have been presumptuous of me to be so critical. What I saw and heard left me unimpressed. I was no longer interested in campaigning for Cambridge University graduates, but quite satisfied in the products of our local technical colleges. I now understand why so few university men seem to go to places in industry. When I showed the report of this visit to Sir Roy Fedden, he said, 
You've seen nothing. Go to Oxford. When writing in 1975, Doughty said that they had 700 apprentices at any one time. The Doughty archive holds several hundred apprentice indentures, record cards and correspondence files about the apprentices engaged by the Doughty group. They went to several different companies within the group, Doughty Fuel Systems, Doughty Group Services, Doughty Hydraulics and so on. George Doughty was recognised within Cheltenham and nationally for his work. In 1954, he was made an honorary freeman of the boroughs of both Cheltenham and Tewkesbury. In 1956, he was honoured with a knighthood, which he was delighted with, but in his book, he shows his displeasure with the lack of honours for services to industry. In 1956, not one of the knighthoods awarded were for services to industry. Doughty's own was actually for services to the disabled. He joined the board of Remploy in 1955, and successfully got members of Remploy into factories. Also in 1955, he was awarded the gold medal for outstanding achievements in the design and development of aircraft equipment by the Royal Aeronautical Society. And he was president of both the Gloucester and Cheltenham branch and the society as a whole at different times. Sir George Doughty died in 1975, not long after he wrote his autobiography and his company continued for nearly 20 years after that. In 1992, the company was sold to TI Group, and that was when conversations started with Gloucestershire Archives about the transfer of the archives to Gloucester, which happened finally in 1997. <coughs> the company that Sir George Doughty left in 1975 was one that had implanted itself into countries throughout the world. Among others, industries represented by Doughty Group companies included mining, hydraulics, rubber products, communications, electrics, marine, nuclear, and of course, the aviation industry, which was where it all started. There were probably a hundred different Doughty companies throughout the 60 years of the Doughty Group. The group sale in 1992 met with anger from the company's employees, and it was certainly a hostile takeover. In the Doughty archive, we hold a telegram from Lady Doughty acknowledging condolences following her husband's death. The telegram says, Following the sad death of our founder, Sir George, Lady Doughty and her family have received so many condolences from his friends and employees in the group that she felt she would like to send a personal message to you all. My son George and my daughter Virginia and I wish to express our deep appreciation of the hundreds of messages and tributes paid by so many of you since Sir George passed away. It is impossible to thank you personally but it has brought great warmth and comfort to us at this time to know how much he was loved and respected by all who worked with him in his large group. It was his last wish that you continue to serve and carry on his life's work with the same undivided loyalty that made this once small business into a worldwide organisation. May we wish you all and your families peace and goodwill in the years to come. I want to finish this talk with a quote from Sir George's own foreword to his book. He writes, I started my engineering business in 1930 with just £50 to my name. Many friends said I was crazy and throwing up a safe job as a draftsman earning £5 a week. But had I possessed £5,000 then, the struggle that awaited me would have been the same. The years that followed were those of the depression and great unemployment. My lack of money forced me to improvise, to do without and to operate with the greatest economy. Looking back at this distance, I feel it is no real hardship to be short of cash when starting an independent career, provided you have the stamina to withstand difficult and rigorous times. In Doughty's autobiography, he reminds us time and time again that his perseverance was key to his success. He was a relentless businessman, and whilst he obviously did do well out of his business, what I take from his book was always the desire to improve, invent new things, diversify, and never assume that a thing was perfect. This allowed him to become one of the largest employers in the Cheltenham and Tewkesbury areas. His legacy is everywhere. Most people in the area worked for Doughty Group companies or know someone who did. His work is still being honoured by companies such as Safran, Doughty Propellers and Trelleborg. Many of his employees still do work for those companies, among many others, 30 years after the sale of the Doughty Group. And now we have the catalogued archive the Community Heritage website and the published book to continue the legacy 
and also hopefully continue the conversations into future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ali, for a fantastic, fascinating lecture on the history of the Adati Group. It is wonderful that the Adati legacy continues in so many of the local companies today. And thank you to everyone who was able to join us tonight.